Hey everybody, this is Tuvia Kopstein and I am more than pleased to welcome you to episode two of the Jewish Music Platform. Now, we're going to talk about rap music today. Now, everybody knows that the rap, rap music in general is speaking to the baser aspects of the human existence. And when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, I saw rap coming from the ghetto to the suburbs to becoming the dominant form of popular music in the world. And I remember a particular song that was especially catchy that was speaking about two of the three Averos Hamuros. Um, but I was also aware at the same time that rap music could deliver a positive message and could speak to the soul and the intellect. Now, when I found out my friend Moshe Friedman and his friends were putting rap together with Torah, with Chazal, I was very intrigued and I was blown away about how talented they are. Here's a, here's a sample. It's something they put out about seven years ago that I saw and it really impressed me. Take a look. No need to go and reinvent the wheel. Every building starts with cement and steel. Originality is immense appeal. But novelty for novelty's sake is such a novice mistake. He couldn't possibly make it so obvious to anyone who's honest with the process he takes. That the only way to start to create is to build on the knowledge that's been solidly placed. Cause you never build a rocket ship to fly in the sky until you know the math to multiply and divide. And you never kill the world of all the deadly disease until you know all the formulas the chemistry needs. It's true in life and so it is with most art without the scales you'll never be a Mozart even if you're so smart and you got the most heart with no technique creativity gets no start the language of the world is not imaginary you could use it as your tool and not your adversary because once you see the words are written on the pad already the question then becomes how big is your vocabulary <laughs> that wasn't just beautiful and true but it was also fun I'm fond of quoting this when somebody says something and says why should I believe this is true? Because I thought of it. I made it up. In fact, I remember there was a saxophone player when I was in 12th grade. I took jazz improvisation at the local junior college. And this guy was like wild playing music that was you know, way off. And there was a certain structure to what we were trying to do. It's obvious this guy didn't have any technique and nobody took him seriously because he didn't start from the technique. So you see that. There's a truism here. Enough of me talking. Enjoy this interview with Moshe Sherazin and I with the great Rav Mo. Okay, welcome to the Jewish Music Platform. We're super excited to have Rav Mo, the Moshe Friedman, coming at us from London, England. Ooh. Hi, guys. Great to be here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Rav Mo. Okay, so Rav Mo, Moshe Friedman. Um, we would love to speak to you about the music you make, the poetry that you that you make, where where the origin is, your origin story, how you came from, wherever you came from to where you are now, <laughs> yeah. and how the music came along with you and evolved with your with your life. So we'd just love love to start out with just letting you tell your story, like how how did you get. Involve, first of all, where the, does the rap music come from, and and what what was your involvement with, with it? With it, how did it come into your transformation as an as a young adult, and how did that how did the music move with you? I want to say this, I am so excited to have you here because when we uh when we when Tuvia told me that we're gonna have you on the show, he sent me a couple links, and I actually heard one of your songs back in the day, the Spark. You know that one? You know you know that one. You know that one? Okay. I think it may have been the soundtrack on a Kickstarter video. I don't know where I heard it. Was it maybe? It's probably in the background there. Yeah. Yeah. Like many years ago. And I just uh, listened to your music and I was so, so impressed by the diversity within the music. And I'm very excited to learn more about you and what your music's all about. So welcome. Great. Great. Well, I'm really, really glad to be here. So if we go back to the origin story. Like all good origin stories, it starts by being bitten by a radioactive spider. And then somehow I woke up and I could start rapping and then and climbing walls. It was amazing. So uh, I'd say that it starts from the humble beginnings, like many good rapper stories in the streets of New York, although probably not the same streets that the other rappers grew up in. Mine were the streets of the Upper East Side of Manhattan. 
not not the most uh, toughest neighborhood, but certainly a very interesting and in some ways very bizarre neighborhood full of um full of uh, investment bankers and uh and you know an overachieving young private school students i i guess it was a bit of an accident that i got into rap music i just happened to have a very close friend who himself was really into rap music and his his obsession was infectious and we both started listening and then eventually we both started writing music uh and I suppose it was always a hobby for me. It was always something that was fun to do, and it was something that got some laughs and also was a little bit impressive as well. So it was always something that I kept in my back pocket. And then um, as I got to university, I figured, you know, what the heck, let's let's give it a go. Let's try doing something real. So I put out my first official project when I was 19 or 20 years old. Can I ask how many years ago that was? Oh, uh, oh, so yeah. I'm 36, so that would be 17 years ago. 17 years ago. Um, so I put out about seven songs, eight songs, I think, on a on an EP. Um, I designed the cover myself. I made all the music. I made the instrumentals. I mixed it. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I haven't listened to it in quite some time because it's not exactly, quote unquote, appropriate uh, to listen to. Yeah, I was going to ask if you, could, if you could show us the album cover, but maybe better not. Well, the album cover, I think, so to be honest with you, I don't even know if I still have the album art. I don't have a copy of the, of the CD anymore, although I'm sure it's still floating around somewhere. I remember um, I was in a fraternity and I had the, the brothers or the guys who were getting initiated underneath us. I had them out selling the CD out on the main walk on campus for me as part of their initiation process. So not bad. It could be worse. Yeah. So worse. it was look, it was fun. I did I did university shows and uh and basically, you know, had a good time with it. It never it never really got any bigger than that. Um then I guess the well ran dry. I, I you know a lot of the things I was writing about were relatively immature college parties and and you know crushes on you know on you know romantic interests and things like that and it was really not that deep and so so it was not so difficult to 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 run out of things to talk about in that vein but if you fast forward a few years later where um after a very pregnant yada 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 uh i found myself in israel studying in yeshiva uh in a total, totally different direction from what I had. What, what yeshiva was that? That was that was at Machon Shlomo in Harnof. Uh-huh. Went to went to yeshiva a few months after I graduated university. It was a very, very interesting story. I don't know if you want to get into that story, but um, but after my first year in university, where I'm now overflowing with unbelievably inspiring ideas. You know more than I could handle, probably. Uh, at that point, I was inspired by another uh, young guy who who was in the sister yeshiva, Machon Yaakov, who himself was a mus- musician, not a rapper. But I saw how he had successfully translated his craft into something Jewish, and that inspired me to say, "Oh, okay. Well, look, I've got a talent, and if I just take." holy words instead of really profane words and put that to music. Well, let's see what happens. And what I found was it turns out that rap music is really conducive to uh, to getting across a very deep idea for a few reasons. Number one, simply because there are more words in a rap song than in a regular song. So you can convey much more complex and sophisticated, sophisticated ideas than a regular song. And the second reason is because the nature the, the the medium lends itself to a powerful punchline so you can set up an idea and then you can really hammer it home um with the rhythm and with the flow in a way that people just it hits you in the gut if you have a, if you have something good to say so for those reasons i found that when i started doing this people would perk their ears up even if they would not normally have been interested in listening to your average class on Judaism, they'd come away with that saying, well, that was really cool. Can you do another one? So that that really motivated me 
to keep going. Mm -hmm. So quick question about your music. When you, um, besides the actual words, did the style of the music change? Like a lot, a lot of rap music, I'm not a, an expert in rap. <clears throat> but when I think of rap, I think of sort of just like a bass line, a very simple beat, and then you got the rapper, right? But the Living Wells, you know, that stuff and, and, and your new stuff, that is very, very musical, right? Would you agree? So, like, so the question is, was your original music also very musical or the actual style of the, the music and melody change as well? So it's interesting that the, um, the genre of rap has really changed. I would say that the, the typical, you know, bass line with a, with a drum beat and then a rapper would be maybe like early mid 90s style. And then around, you know, the late 90s. So you started having, so, you know, Puff Daddy started like, like really changed the face of pop rap because he would, he would uh, sample these very rich, uh, poppy sounds from the 1980s. Um, I'm coming out, right? And that was like a huge hit. And all of a sudden people realized that rap music actually sounded good over real music. Um, you didn't have to just take a, some simple loop, cut out all the highs, leave only the bass, and then, and then rap over it. People now wanted to experiment with music. And then after that, coming from my own personal influence, um, around 2003 was when uh, Kanye West came out. And he also took um, instrumental rap music to a, to another level where he really started adding a lot more musical elements. And, um, and I would say that a lot of my earlier style really came as a result of early Kanye West's music. And, you know, I can track other people's contributions to the genre of hip hop that, that has influenced me. Now, I would say that to a certain extent, I try to stay up to date with current rap trends because I don't want to constantly sound like I'm stuck in 2007. And I try to the best of my can, to the best of my ability to, to really only put a toe into that world because Despite the fact that the genre itself is beautiful and amazing and powerful, the content is often horrific, um, really destructive to one's soul and psychological well-being. So with a few exceptions, with a few notable exceptions, where there, you can still find some beautiful music in mainstream who? rap. Can I ask who? Who? Um, yeah, there are some very positive people. I think I think Chance the Rapper has had yeah. has put out some really positive Chance, music. The rapper. Yeah. Um Macklemore, some of his songs are really very, very inspiring. Um, even, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I'm, I want to think carefully before I give my stamp of approval. You know, again, I'm I'm still gonna say, like, uh, you know, a lot of times these people are are, you know, using profanity all over the place. And you know it does hurt my neshama to do that. And and when I can, I try to look for the for the censored version. Um, I consider this to be like the hazard of trying to to bring relevant music to people in a way that that's possible. And I try to limit it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Got it. I have a question. I, I want to tell you my my own experience with rediscovering you as a person because you're somebody I knew. I happen to be living in Harnof, where Machon Shlomo is, and very involved with the yeshiva when Moshe came to yeshiva, at least for that first year. I think I left after, after your first year. And, and when I, I, got, I got an email that when Living Wells came out with their first album, so our friend Rafi Billick, who said, you guys, you got you to gotta listen to this. He put it out on the Machon Shlomo email list. He said, you guys, you got to listen to this. He's, he's weaving Chazal, into these these beautiful rhymes and the music is great and so I thought I would check it out and and I had an interesting reaction because I was not in the I was sort of totally separated from the world of popular music for many years and I listened to it and I at first I thought wait he's trying to he's trying to sound like somebody else he's not trying to sound like himself and then I, the more I listened, I thought, this is amazing. <laughs> the more I listened, the more I like it. I, I, I loved it. I got the CD. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't play it for my kids, but <laughs> just because, just because they, like, they don't need it to, to have to find meaning in, in Judaism. But, but I, I love it. And I followed it. And I share it with every friend that I think would enjoy it. And I found, I found some interesting 
interesting fans, you know, fans that you wouldn't necessarily know would become fans. And uh, I have to admit, I was disappointed when the Living Wells broke up, but but um, still very happy to see that you're you're creating, you're continuing to create in this genre, which you are so skilled at creating in, with HUK. I'd love to ask you about what what you're doing now with HUK, how you, how you take this and and the videos you put out now with HUK and what what you're hoping to accomplish with those videos. Well, yeah, first of all, yeah. you, wait, sorry, sorry, much. Sorry. Specifically, are you trying to catch attention, the attention of the of the listener, to give them a little bit of insight into 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 the the depth that there is in Torah, and then to get them to ask the next question? Is that what you're trying to accomplish, or perhaps you're trying to accomplish something else? Okay. So, first of all, just from the beginning, I appreciate the kind words. I really. You know, I, I'm I'm still susceptible to flattery, despite the fact that we're supposed to be running away from covered. Yeah, it still is take always it, take nice. It, enjoy to, it. Uh, take it. It works hard. Always, you know. Yeah, it's always good to hear validation that that people like what you do. Um, I would say that in terms of you know the music that I put out in the past, I guess I wasn't really thinking about what my audience was, which is maybe one reason why, it, probably one reason why a lot of people loved it is because I wasn't trying to fit it into a particular box. Um, I was just like, I can rap. I found a couple friends who can sing and play music, uh, wildly eclectic people, and we just put it out there. And 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 the reaction is that that I get cover goes from the spectrum of like what you said, which is I appreciate it, but I wouldn't play it for my kids because they don't need it, to people who say I would I ideally play this for my children because the messages are so profound. And, you know, I think the jury's out. Look, I, I certainly understand the sensitivity in terms of the, the genre of rap music. It is a hard hitting. It's not a soft and gentle type of music, right? So I do know that there are certain people out there who would say that the medium is the message. It's not the words that you that you say. I believe, I actually think that there's a Rambam, Rambam who says, you know, in, I think on Perky Avos somewhere that says, you know, there are all these... Uh, um, you know, there's this, uh, the, the mainstream Jewish music that people listen to is so cr crass. Um, whereas like there's these very beautiful Arabic songs, love songs or whatever about God or whatever, which are actually much nicer than the Jewish music that we listen to. Um, I, I still, however, think that, uh, you know, as long as, as long as the music isn't too loud and too harsh and too impactful, again, you know, the style, if you've listened to my music, we try to make it very melodic. We try to make it very, um, very orchestral and use a lot of, you know, beautiful instruments instead of, instead of making it a little bit too, um, too bass heavy and beat heavy. In any case, um, now what we're doing, so yeah, we made a conscious decision to, to end the project of the Living Wells, which we released that album in 2015. And unfortunately, the, the main actors who were involved in that project, one of them lives in America and one of them lives in Israel and I live in London. So it just wasn't feasible anymore to continue in that incarnation. Uh, when I got to London, I started working for Ace UK and I quickly uh, realized that there is a burgeoning media department here at Aish, and I thought, why don't I offer my skills? At first, I offered them in the form of spoken word poetry, which was something that I had not dabbled in as much, but I was inspired by the likes of, what's his name? Prince E, right? Prince E.A., who, um, who really put out, I mean, he his messages are incredibly positive, really very inspiring and and he got a lot of attention for it so i thought why don't we do something jewish like that so i i that i tried i experimented with that genre and to and got some very positive feedback in the last few years though i thought well hold on a second like well why don't we try to make rap music one of the reasons why i was hesitant to do so at the beginning is because making music is way more labor intensive way more labor intensive more expensive than just finding a nice, beautiful symphonic instrumental and and you know using a, a, a home studio 
to make a, uh, you know, to, to say over a beautiful spoken word poem. To make real music, it needs to sound crisp. People don't realize that what they listen to on the radio or any almost anything they listen to on Spotify has been professionally mix, mixed and mastered. They don't realize that, but their ears will pick up if they hear a song that's neither mixed nor mastered or only one of the two. They will re- they are, Their ears will hear it. They won't realize what it is that's wrong with the song, but they'll think like, this doesn't sound professional. So in order to be able to do that, you need a a lot more intention. You need the beat that goes into it. You need to find sometimes sometimes you need to find a musician, a singer who can sing the chorus because I'm not that great of a singer. Uh, so all of that was a big barrier to entry. Not to mention, it just it's extremely expensive, extremely expensive. So um, we the my my return to the rap arena came to about a year and a half ago when there was a major uh, headline, a major piece of news in England where a British rapper named Wiley, he was very big rapper in the UK scene, let out a barrage of anti-Semitic tweets, like really bad, like the Jews own the banks and like the Jews are trying to get your money and they own, and they run everything and whatever. And later he backtracked and said he was sorry or whatever. But but at the time it was like a terrible uproar. So a close friend of mine who runs the media department at Age said, "Look, you're a rapper, so why don't you respond in rap?" And that that rap went totally viral. Over a hundred thousand people saw it on Facebook, and. Um, and it was, and it was that moment where I realized, oh wow, I forgot how powerful music can be to change people's minds. So rather than you know, you asked me to be like, what was my intent? I would say it was more like we did something and then realized later what the intent could be. So when I saw that, we realized that there are in that song in particular, there were many many people who are sympathetic to let's say anti-Semitism but wouldn't necessarily go search out something specifically Jewish or Torah related. So we thought, let's try to create music where there's an intersection between broader Jewish interests, whether it's uh, anti-Semitism, an upcoming song that we have is going to be one about simply Jerusalem, which is just a, you know, a uniting banner for so many Jewish people, their love of Israel. Um, Last winter, uh, so in the winter of 2021, we re- released our, that was our biggest push for Rav Mo. That was kind of the release of Rav Mo, where we released Light One More, which is a Hanukkah song referring to the opinion of Beis Hillel that we always write light one more than the night before, instead of lighting one less like Beis Shammai. And, uh, and there we made a big push. We got it professionally uh, produced, mixed, mastered. We put out a decent music video given the amount of time and, and resources that we had, and again got an excellent response. And so that has now motivated us to keep going. I see that you're able to react to current events re- relatively quickly. For instance, when there were these attacks in the um, in with this recent attack on a, Jew- on a synagogue in Texas, I saw that about a week later, Rav Mo had a response, and it was up on YouTube. Was that a, was that a song? Or was that a it was a rap. It was again. So it was a. Uh, so we we put out something shorter, right? It was about a minute and a half long. There was no real chorus, but uh, there was a bit of a hook, right? Beth Israel not safe anymore. Poway synagogue not safe anymore. So referring to all the different uh, shootings of synagogues in America, and yeah, we made a conscious decision. If there's something really big like that, it's time to release something. Um, as quickly as possible. Now, normally my writing process, if I'm if I'm working on something, it takes me at least a couple of weeks, a few weeks to be able to write something. In that, I had to come out with it in a couple of days. And then we filmed, and, I, and you know, the, 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 the video is very simple. We just went to a nearby park and filmed over there. Um, but yeah, that's part of it, is trying to capitalize on the Jewish interests that, the broader Jewish community might have and show them that there is something powerfully and uniquely Jewish 
not just culturally Jewish, but something that touches your neshama, something that can can help you gain access to your heritage. Uh, that that's 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 the intersection we're trying to to approach. How do you get your stuff out there? Is it like your 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 private Facebook page, or is it is it TikTok, or is it is it the your organization's Facebook page? Yeah. Or? We're still experimenting with the with the types of branding and marketing. Again, this is all in house. This is all, you know, charity. Ace UK is not a record label. <laughs> you know, we uh, we're we're a bunch of rabbis and rabbitsons and 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 we we good at teaching Torah classes and stuff like that. And so we're really just trying to make it up as we go along. I've been trying for a while to pitch a a much broader project where. The marketing is there, the branding is there, creating professional sounding music and videos, and then creating a uh, an ecosystem of of classes and and events that describe and embellish the Torah content of the music. Um, that's something that I'd really love to do because I see the power of music, and I see that you can very easily and frankly, I mean, you know, there's a there's a very interesting book as a it's not such a tangent but it's important there's a very interesting book called strange rights r i t e s that was written about the new phenomena in the united states that have attempted to replace religion since attendance in uh, organized religion has been declining since the 1970s so there've been all, there've been all these kind of movements to not replace religion itself but all the aspects of of life that religion has for so many Millennia uh, provided so community and a sense of transcendence and a sense of purpose and meaning and so what you have is the social justice movement gives you a great sense of meaning and purpose uh, and maybe even a little bit of community the, um, the the well-being and the wellness movement gives you that sense of transcendence um, you know you go to like a you know some of these fitness classes are almost like cultish, right? Um, one of the things that they found was that most consistently, the area where people derived their spiritual experiences on a regular basis was from music. Music is what is now replacing spirituality, or, it's, or at least that's where people are connecting to their spirituality in the most common way. And so if you know that, then you realize that like, why make people sit in a lecture when they just don't go to lectures anymore? Why not? Why you know the Jewish people have? I believe there is a strong masora, a strong tradition for taking Jewish content, real Torah content, and using any medium necessary. Well, within reason, almost. Yeah, I, I don't think we're gonna you know do like heavy metal, you know, Jewish. You know, <laughs> you'd be well, maybe our, maybe not. Upcoming guests. Yeah. Okay. Maybe No, no, no. It's always good to have a Havamina and then to show that you're wrong from the Havamina. It's great. Say, it's great. Fantastic. Know. If someone can be Makadish heavy metal, then Kolakavot. In any case, um, yeah, I, I just I think that we should be seeking um we should be seeking the the audiences where they are and and within reason, within limit, not not coming down to their level, but just walking, just opening the door and coming into into their their arena. Let me ask you. This is, I'm very curious in this and this that you're bringing up now. The I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of somebody who who didn't have the experience I had of growing up secular, having the tremendous opportunity and gift of going to yeshiva as a young adult. And seeing and 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 bring incorporating Torah into my life and, and becoming a, uh, a hopefully a Ben Torah, <laughs> um, and at, at a mature age where it's, the choices were meaningful. But I'm trying to think, put myself in the shoes of somebody who is who's Jewish and identifies as such, and then comes across some great content from HUK or similar, something that catches the attention. How does it then progress from there? to the next step to, to the point where okay this was this was a great rhyme like how do how do i get to a point in which i take it to the i i, I want i'm curious now how do i investigate about what this person is talking about how do i 
how do I get involved? You know, would I even want to get involved? Or would just would I just say, you know, that's a nice rhyme, and now I move on to the next distraction. So I've been experimenting with this for a long time. When we released our first album, The Living Wells, uh, one of the things that I did was in conjunction with the album, I published a lyric book. And in the lyric book, there was basically a parish at the bottom. I wrote down in the footnotes all the different sources and the ideas that, that the lyrics were coming from. And I would sell those at the concerts and we sold them all. Like I think I maybe have one left that I'm keeping for myself. Um, there, this is what, so today, digitally, there are many people that you can look to who do this in a, in a fantastic way, right? I'll give you one example. So the, um, it's not exactly equivalent, but it's close enough would be someone like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is this internet phenomenon. He is a Scott, he's an academic. He essentially mastered the idea of putting out a one minute or a two minute clip on YouTube that would really catch the attention of its, fo of its followers. He talk about the mythology of a Disney film or something like that. And people are like, ooh, that's powerful. And then what you see on your feed after that is, well, now listen to like a 10 minute clip. You know, now, now you're a little bit bought in. You're willing to give him a little bit more of your time. And then he talks about something else really captivating about the necessity of free free speech in you know in modern society or how yeah, whatever it is how the how cancel culture has gone too far whatever you want to say after you listen at, if there's enough of those now i'm bought in to listen to a full 2 hour lecture from jordan peterson so the idea would be in a similar vein and this is something that we're trying to play around with is you click on the music video because it's a music video. It's cool. Okay, great. A Hanukkah rap. Great. Let's listen to that. And then what we had on the back of that was on the YouTube clip, what would pop up would be a little banner saying, well, why don't you watch Rev Mo explain the lyrics, right? And what we found was we got about a 2% click rate, which is pretty good, to be honest. That was pretty good click rate. Uh, now we figure like this. If we can make a smash hit song now in Jewish terms, that's about a million views, right? For a music video. If you'd got a million views on your music video, that was a great video, right? There's some that have more than that, but that's, that's a pretty good threshold. Now imagine that 2% of people click through to just your one minute or two minute lyric explainer, right? So now 2% of a million people that's already 20,000 people. Am I doing the math right? I think so. Okay. So now you say, now you imagine that of those 20,000 people, let's say you had another funnel, which said that if you liked that, why don't you listen to Rev Mo's half hour talk on the subject of music or on the subject of Hanukkah or whatever, or Rev Mo having a discussion with this person of note, who you may also know from somewhere else on the subject of Hanukkah or music. Okay, now imagine 2% of people click through to that. So we're now speaking about something like 500 people, right? Now there, I think I got the math wrong. Um, help me out here. What's 2% what's of 20,000? 10% would be 2,000. 1% would be 200. 400 people. Okay. For, yeah. So, okay. I did the math. Okay. So roughly 400. Now, if you telling me that we're getting 400 people to, to watch an online Jewish class on the back of a, on the back of a, you know, one, one music video, right? Do you know how hard it is as a rabbi in outreach to get 20 people to show up at your class when you're talking about a subject? And now all of a sudden, it's not just 400 people who are like happy to come because of the sushi. These are 400 people who are bought into you because they love your music and they like what you have to say. And those 400 people would be willing to show up at a concert or a Shabbaton and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, so the, the idea there is that there, this this model would potentially even be more cost effective than current outreach efforts are today. That's very interesting. That's so. Do you have such a song that you're working on, like the hit? 
Big hit. So yeah, we're working on a couple, man. Um, so right now we are we're rushing to get out a Pesach song. This Pesach song is just a straight pop Pesach song, but it's still got its depth. Um, it still refers to the idea of you know the song is called Unleavened, and it's constantly referring to the idea of right, uh, right. So just to give you a taste, right? It's like. Um, so it so it starts with the idea of um right I have been dreaming of freedom breaking the chains of my weakness but something is keeping me down yup it's the bread that I'm eating sits in my stomach too heavily searching for simpler recipes you need to detox that's what my nutrition is telling me and my rabbis would agree though I've been puffed up by my ego so this passover season I'm letting the yeast go right so it's like Okay, right there, we just talked about Saor Shabi Isa, right? We just we just introduced the idea that most people are unfamiliar with, which is that the idea of leavening and puffed up has to do with the Yetzirah and the idea that Yetzirah puffs about you up. Puff Daddy that you mentioned earlier. Maybe yeah, that's what he meant. Daddy, yeah. Know? Well, maybe that's why he stopped going by Puff yeah, Daddy. He did. Now he, you know, reinvented himself. Um, in any case, that that's as pop as you can get. Um, but at the same time, you know, and then I'm talking about, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm checking the cracks and the crevices. I'm searching for my soul for some blemishes. Like I'm, I'm equating these two things, right? That, that the idea of searching for chametz in your house is also the idea of searching, doing a chesh and nefesh inside of you. Now that in itself won't give you the whole idea. But if you're listening to that song and then you double click, so then all of a sudden that opens you up to a whole world of, of Torah content that you may have never been exposed to before. And the relevance of Badika's chametz in our lives and the relevance of not eating chametz in our lives is something that I, I care so much about as a, personally, as a, as a young person who grew up with almost nothing in Judaism being immediately relevant to my life. No messages that really resonated with me and how to make me a better person and how this will enhance and enrich my life. You know, if somebody had given me the, the key to just open up how, you know, how you can relate to something as esoteric as tefillin or, um, you know, or any other Jewish mitzvah or ritual, like I see people's eyes light up. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were giving a talk on wine, right? And why we drink wine. And I said, you know, isn't it amazing that whenever we mark a celebration in time, we use alcohol? And the reason is because alcohol is itself a manifestation of the sanctity of time. What time does to a physical substance is breaks it down and shows a deeper hidden element to that substance. And somebody in the class was like, Oh my God. And this was a girl who went to a Jewish school her whole life and had, you know, kind of become disconnected. And the and the, the the light just flashed before her eyes that 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 like these things aren't coincidental and I can now I can now place the ritual to the act and I can embed meaning in what it is that I'm doing in my life and it has meaning to me in real time. That's what I'm really trying oh, to do. Wow. Do you have a song about wine? Wait, wait. Yeah. You. Wait, I noticed uh, as you no. say this, Ravmo, I want I noticed that on your WhatsApp status you have a little quote from Manifesto. Right? And it's, this is what you're saying. And would you like to say what what is your byline? Yeah, the byline is trying to find meaning in the beauty. Did I find that right? Or did I or, or did I put it the other way? Or was it f and finding beauty in the meaning, right? That's really what it is. It's to find meaning in the beauty and beauty in the meaning. Um this is totally it is if there's one thing that I'm so proud of for being a Jew, it's that we do not eschew, we do not avoid uh, aesthetics. We don't say that what's physically beautiful is wrong, morally corrupt and dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous, but that does not deter us from, uh, from trying to utilize it in, in the greatest way possible. In fact, on the contrary, the first parak of of Masil Sisharim says that look, if, you know, if you want to, if you want the simple level of, of being in this world, it's to just do what you're told. If you want a higher level, it's to 
actually fight the milchama of your Yetzirah and, and Tov and Ra. But if you want the really deepest level, the reason why you're here is not because this world is a booby-trapped obstacle course waiting for you to mess up. The, you're in the world because the world is beautiful. And if you can find the hidden spiritual beauty in the world, then, then you win the grand prize. Yaakov, who's able to, to take the lowest mineral life on the planet and turn it into something sanctified, that's it. That's what we're going for. So I'm just trying to try to live that. I'm trying to find trying to find the meaning in the beauty. And the beauty in the meaning. Amazing. Okay. You should, you should have a lot of success. Now we we love to this is great. I'm really happy that we we got all to, we got all this out. <clears throat> Excuse me. We like to add, just end with a few quick quick questions. Do you ever Go for Moshe, it. do you ever write something that you you look at it after you wrote and you say this is garbage, you go straight in the trash? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Like uh, you know, I'm personally somebody who um everyone has their own process. I massage and nurture and and obsess over the, the lyrics that I write and so when I push something out, it's like giving birth almost, you know, uh, my, if, if my wife hears that she'll be very offended because she'll say, no, it's nothing <laughs> like giving birth. But, but what I mean is that I really care a lot about getting it right the first time, which makes it very difficult to engage in the editing process and makes it even more difficult when I realize that it's, it's just not, you know, it's not hitting. Um, other people are incredibly prolific and for every you know, every fifty songs they write, they'll they'll publish one. But uh, but despite that, even though I don't write as prolifically as that, and I do, I, I really put a lot of time and effort into each song that I write. I still recognize that you just can't put everything out there, and that's part of the process, and that's part of and you know there I can I can definitely count on you know there's about four or five songs which I've had to revisit and come back to over years before I've gotten the final, the final version out. Mm -hmm. And for you as composing, like it, it sounds like you put a lot of work into your, your songs and each song, but does it come easy to you? Like, let's say like right now we go, we have this, you know, in current events, we have the Ukraine story going on right now. Uh, is, is that something like when, 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 when the current events happen, do this music just come to you? Do the rhymes come to you? You think about the spot. Can you just like talk now? Can you freestyle about Ukraine from the heart? Or is it something that you sit and work on? There's a spectrum, you know, they say Bob Dylan, like, you know, wrote his songs in like 15 minutes and he just types away on his typewriter and then comes out with like a massive hit. Now I'm not that level of the spectrum. Uh, then again, there's the, you know, the, the Leonard Cohen's who like, it took him 15 years to write Hallelujah. Oh, now, now I guess it was worth it, right? <laughs> it, was, it was worth it. Uh, but, um, but I think it comes in waves. There are there are periods of time where I'll write you know five new songs in in a space of a, of a couple months, and then there are times where I'm just dry, and and there are practices that I try to do to get myself back into it. There are certain songs that I'll listen to to get inspiration, and of course, writing as painful as it is to write when you are uninspired, that is part of what gets you back into the inspiration. Uh, but I also recognize and have the humility to realize that when it comes, it's coming from something higher than me. And so it takes a little bit of the pressure off for me to have to be impeccably consistent, uh, you know, throughout the entire course of a year. I just don't expect that. Do you have a vocabulary that you find yourself coming back to? Like, for instance, you have a YouTube video that, that was on that became a song on your first album, maybe your second album. Where it was, it was improv. It was in the old city of Jerusalem, and and ostensibly it was uh, it was Moshe Friedman doing free flow. What's the word? Um, free, freestyling. freestyling, and it, and it came out amazing, uh, mind blowing. It's mind blowing. What's it called? How and how do, how do our listeners find it? How do they find it? Um, gosh, it probably is on YouTube under the Living Wells. Probably one of the first first ones we put out. Look, I'll stop you right there because I don't want to misrepresent myself. I do not freestyle. Everything I do is written. I have tremendous respect for people who can just rap without having thought of what they are rapping. 
but I I want to write down and be conscious and careful and calculated in what it is that I say. So when I when I go do something like that on the street, it's something that I've already written. So yeah. Here's a question that I take from another another podcast. This would be just to give credit where credit is due, 1840 podcast. If you had a a year-long sabbatical, if you were given a grant to support your family for a year and to work on a project, then what would that project be? Do I have a budget more than for more than just supporting my family or uh you have a budget to put to produce the, the support your family and produce the entire project. Yeah, so then I'd go back to the, the plan that I was talking about before, which is this um, this ecosystem of of educational content surrounding music. I think that it's possible. I think that it's that there's a good a good chance that with the right, in other words, you know, any any time you engage in the music industry. The odds are, you know, not great. However, you can significantly increase those odds if you know what you're doing. If you've got, for example, a list of cameos that you've lined up of people that that people already know, you know, musicians and singers that people already know, and you have them come on your music, already that's going to increase your chances. If you know, if you get producers and people who make music who know what's popular right now. So, for example, when we did light one more. Uh, the producer you're working with is a great guy. He doesn't normally work in Jewish music. And the first thing he said when he heard that the just the idea, the bare bones idea for the song was, oh, we can turn this into a hit that's similar to what's trending right now. And I think at the time it was Dynamite by that Korean band. Um, I can't remember. They're, they have three initials. BDS, no, BSD, whatever it is. Um, SD, SDB, I can't remember. It's not BDS, BTS, BTS. It's um, so so they knew like ah, there's this sound that's trending right now, and and unconsciously people want to be Madama Milsa La Milsa, and they want to hear something that's similar to what they've heard already. Um, branding and marketing, like all these things, like if you know what you're doing, and you have a good product, then you can make it happen. You just got to be professional enough. You just you need the startup money to be able to do it. So, I I think that is a totally worthy endeavor. And frankly, it would be a, for me. It's a longer term project, which is that if I can, you know, I would use myself as the test subject to see if it can be done. Um, but I would look to to find other Jewish talent where we could do the same thing around them. Um, and make this something real and lasting and use and, and say that Jewish music is more than just something nice that you play at a chasana. It's more than something nice that you, uh, you know, you go have a kumzitz. It, it's actually got the potential to be extremely powerful. I think there's this disconnect with, you know, popular Jewish music is like, sometimes it's so hokey. And I love it. It's great. I want to listen to it. I want to dance to it. but there is a there is a tradition of Jewish music that is so powerful, and people for millennia have been using music as a means to connect to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. And I think only recently people have started to realize how much they can tap in. I think Yishai Rebo managed to figure out a way to to just open up the Israeli neshama with music that is dripping with Torah content, and at the same time you like. You know, I've never been to a, a concert of his, but I've heard it's like it's a it's a it's a spiritual experience to go to a concert. Like, why aren't we doing that more often? Um, and I know there are people out there who are starting to do exactly that. So, can you name can you name some besides Yishai Rebo? Are there are there certain people that our listeners can can start being aware of that are trying to do this? Oh man, um, well I can you know, I can try to think of the people who who inspire me. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you, like, I, I haven't heard that much from, from the Jewish music world where, you know, th there are, okay, there are musicians that I truly respect and admire. Um, but I don't think there's, there are that many people who are pushing the envelope to see what, what the medium really offers 
the potential that it really has for people to come away blown away. You know, just the most recent example is literally a week ago, I was found myself on a Shabbaton in up north in England with 80 university students from around the country. And by far, by far the most powerful moment of the Shabbaton for over half of them was the Friday night Oneg, because we sat in a room where the lights were dim and where people were just singing. And every now and then, myself and somebody else would, would trade off kind of telling a Hasidic story. And we're not talking about students who grew up religious. For the most part, they, they did not. Um, and, and still, they, like, they came away saying, I, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know that was part of Judaism. I frankly, didn't know. So why aren't we using this secret weapon? It's like, this is, this, is the, this is the nuclear bomb. Like, come on. Beautiful. Rav Mo, thank you so much for your time. I think a lot of people are going to find what you have to say inspiring. And it'll turn a lot of minds on to think in new directions. And we really appreciate your work. And you should have tremendous success. What you're doing with HUK, your own, your own private projects. May, you're able, may you be able to take your creative energies and, and, and make those funnels that, that lead people, that turn people onto questions and then lead, it, lead to the next step and the next step and the next step. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for creating the platform because I, you know, I have to say, like, it's clear that, that you guys have the same passion for music if you're starting a whole podcast around Jewish music is you realize the potential that music has to bring people close both people who are already consider themselves affiliated, people who are unaffiliated. There's no question that that the ability to sing and the ability to to connect with music takes you so high, and and it's and it's totally legal. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. Be well. Thank you. All the best. Hey everybody, that was great stuff, wasn't it? From a great creative mind. May Hashem bless him with many, many healthy years of creativity on behalf of the Jewish people. Now, if you like the Jewish music platform, please tell your friends about it. Share, like, subscribe. Doesn't matter if your friends listen to podcasts or not. This could be their first one. This could be the entry, the entryway. Because it's almost the Yom Tov of Shavuos, we are happy to append to this podcast a piece from Rav Moshe and his friends, The Living Wells, called The Giving. We think you'll like this. It definitely hits hard and it packs a punch. So enjoy. I took a trip, let me tell you about the trip I took Through scripture so vivid as a picture book Listen, look as I describe the illustration Of the fate of mankind and the birth of a nation We were conceived while slaves in chains And forced out to freedom in labor pains And in 49 days we were reaching the heights In a world of darkness we'd be the beacon of light the young rebels hated like the pebble that became the cornerstone of a temple. We reigned as kings until we were swayed by the devil. Now we stand trial as a nation in exile. Did we forget our origins or regal? A remnant of a people that thinks it's feeble. We're destined to ride on the wings of eagles. But we're so numb, we just feel pins and needles. Not lost though. We're just a little sidetracked. This little nap is a temporary time lapse. The horns blowing, signal in the climax. Rise like a lion, it's time to get our pride back. Tonight I saw the thunder, I heard the lightning cry Yet it all came down on me, I swear that I thought I'd die I thought my life was over, but it had just begun I'm on a secret mission and I won't tell no one Cause this is the giving, this is the giving This is the giving, the giving Today I left my home, I don't know where I'm going Left it all alone, but there's no worries I didn't think things through, but I think it's the thing to do I swear I'll follow you 
Cause you saved me And walking through the cloud Don't know where to go for now At night I fall They forewarned us we'd be dispersed to the four corners We've been forlorn and war torn but before you mourn us Remember what our past has had in store for us In history we haven't had a slow minute We traveled so distant, carried a homesickness Everywhere we went they told us no admittance At best they said you can mind your own business At worst we were tortured and thrown in prisons But after all the pain that our soul has witnessed The struggles in our blood down to our bone thickness Our immortality makes us so different Cause we kept on living and Rome didn't Babylon, Greece, Persia, who's next to fall? They're knocked down like a wrecking ball And even though it laid low, still our heads are tall Cause I see plants sprout from the cracks of the western wall Tonight I saw the thunder I heard the lightning cry Yeah, it all came down on me I swear that I thought I'd die I thought my life was over But it had just begun I'm on a secret mission And I won't tell no one this is the giving, this is the giving You got to find out how you're living, yo This is the giving This is the giving Today we stand as one heart, one man I'll do whatever it takes Okay, now tell us the plan I know inside we'll do what's right I hope I'll see the day when our problems end And we'll return to that promised land And we'll be countless like the stars and sand And even the poor will have a feast like King Solomon We'll end soon what we've been through This new slavery that's got me and you And I know that my dream is true Cause we were slaves once before and we were free then too We sow in tears but always reap in joy Cause a plant can only grow when the seed's destroyed And right now a sprout just under dirt But before the rain there's gonna be some thunder First. So if it hurts so bad, you think you're gonna burst And can't tell if the thirst or the hunger's worse Just remember, the light at the end is so bright Cause we passed through the pitch black tunnel first Tonight I saw the thunder I heard the lightning cry Yeah, it all came down on me I swear that I thought I'd die I thought my life was over But it had just begun I'm on a secret mission And I won't tell no one this is the giving This is the giving It's the giving, yo It's your decision, yo You got to find out how you're living, yo Cause it's the giving This is the giving The giving